If I don't get a chance later on, uh, I want to thank the people who made all of these events this past week possible. Paul, one of them. We have representatives from pretty much every Zionist organization uh, in, in Toronto that I know of. Uh, everyone's here. So we have Dara Sepstein and we have Anita, who's outside taking pictures of the demonstrations, <laughs> and uh, all sorts of all sorts of fun things. But uh, it, it was really very heartwarming when I reached out and said that I would be visiting Toronto. So immediately, I kept getting all these logos in the mail. Put this one on the flyer. We want to be. In, we want to. So everybody kind of just joined forces, and I think that that may have been more worrying to the people outside than anything that I'm going to say this evening. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful thing that the organizations in Toronto uh, work together. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. And uh, what I'm gonna show you this evening may be uh, in some ways a bit disheartening, but uh, the bottom line is that, I know this is, uh, this, this is a slogan that's been used, but yes, we can, we can actually uh, get on top of it, get in front of it, change it, fix it, and make Israel uh, a superpower in every way. Uh, what, it, what it really is, what it should be, what it can be, uh, if we all really continue this spirit of Zionist unity. So with that in mind, we're going to begin the presentation. I want to tell you a little bit first about the organization itself, the organization which is being protested against. It's not the content of what we say, actually, at this point, that uh, woke up all the anti-Zionist groups outside. It's just the organization as an organization. Rigavim was founded 16 years ago by three young Israeli Zionists, each one from a very different, uh, from a very different perspective, with different experiences, but all three of them saw what they understood eventually be different expressions of the same basic problem. The problem that they saw whoops, got it, <laughs> was the failure of the Israeli government to protect, uh, to protect its own sovereignty, to protect the sovereignty of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Got it? So, the, uh, some of the people are more famous than others. One of them is particularly famous. Uh, he is uh, going to be a minister in the incoming government. Um, what some of the organizations outside have uh, complained about are statements that Vitsala Smotrich has made uh, publicly on issues that have absolutely nothing to do with Rigavim's work. He made various statements on other issues that uh, have given anti-Israel activists something to complain about. They have nothing to do with us, and I uh, steadfastly insist that I will make no comments on those topics, because they have nothing to do with our work. Uh, and you can say pretty much anything he wants as a private citizen of Israel. Doing all right? <laughs> okay, so 16 years ago, three young men Together. One of them was an army officer in the Givati Reconnaissance Brigade. He was in charge of patrolling the uh, smuggling routes in the, in the south of Israel. And what he began to understand was that all the things he was seeing on the ground, I can't talk anymore. <laughs> okay. uh, all the things that he was seeing on the ground were um, illegal illegal construction that was swallowing up the entire negative. And he began to ask how and why it was there. He began to ask how and why it was that the IDF was spending so much of its resources dealing with smuggling groups uh, and why it wasn't actually doing army type things. They seemed to him to be police type things, law and order type things. Uh, and he began to ask these questions and realized that there was a massive problem with Israeli policy, 
uh, and that the sovereign state of Israel had failed to protect the land resources of Israel in the, in the Negev region, which is 60% of the land of Israel, and closer to 80% of Israel's available land reserves. So he began to ask those questions, and he was soon introduced to two other young men who were dealing with similar issues in different areas in the country. One of them was Bitsal Smotrich, who was more focused on the issues of lawfare, on the massive project that was at the height of its power at that time, it was around 2005, uh, and he uh, began to track exactly what it was that Peace Now and other New Israel Fund funded uh, organizations were doing uh, to attack is Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. The third person who joined them was a man named Yehuda Eliyahu, whose name you've probably never heard. He was a public servant in the largest municipality uh, in Israel, which is the Binyamin Regional Council. He lived in a, a community, still lives in a community called Haresha, and Peace Now had actually attacked his community in the courts. The community was built uh, on state land, as all Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria are, uh, and 50 meters of the access road to this community had never been registered to the state. So Peace Now filed a petition that the entire community of Harisha be demolished because it is possible that at some point someone might be able to prove that the land, those 50 meters that had never been registered, was used by a private individual for agricultural purposes. Now, I know that this sounds outrageous. It sounds insane that an entire community could be destroyed on these sorts of grounds. We good? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, but that is the actual factual situation in Judea and Samaria today. And I want to explain how that situation has come into being and what the actual, what the legal framework is in Judea and Samaria that allows things like this to happen and that encourages the narrative that is pushed in the United Nations, in the European Union and elsewhere that paints Israel as an occupier as doing things that are illegal, as an oppressor, as, as a national project that is um, disenfranchising native peoples. This is the narrative that you will get if you read uh, any European publication, most um, United Nations publications, and as a matter of fact, pretty much any publications <laughs> except for ours. So I want to talk about the actual facts, because what Rigovim does is we deal in facts, and facts only. Um, someone actually pointed out that the majority of the people at Rigovim, not all, but the majority of re people at Rigovim, our giant, massive, world-famous organization, which consists of 12 people, uh, <laughs> that is what we have, and that includes the person who cleans the office and the, ki the kids who answer the phones. Um, so of the 12 people, the majority are actually observant Jews. Uh, and they said, well, you know, do you talk about your biblical rights? Do you talk about your historic rights? And the answer is, although those things actually empower us and inspire us, they are completely irrelevant to what we do. We deal with law. We deal with facts. That we deal with things that stand up in court and in parliament. And that is what we deal with, that is what we do, and that is what we demand um, of our elected officials to make sure that those laws and those court cases and that public policy reflects uh, the, the rights of the Jewish <coughs> people and the national aspirations of the Jewish people, that it is Zionist policy that enables uh, the Jewish national homeland in Israel to flourish. 
So I'm going to quickly run through now. Uh, pretty much everything I'm going to show you this evening is either maps or aerial photos because we deal in facts. Uh, I'm going to show you a series of maps now to try to explain what makes something legal or illegal in the area that we're talking about this evening. That's our mission statement. You can take that in. These are some of our Many of these people are, uh, have moved into other positions now. This, for example, Isidro Liago uh, is now, this is our Director General. Um, this is Yehuda Liago, who will now be in charge of the uh, position within the Ministry of Defense that will be taking charge of the civil administration. We'll get to that as we go on. But we use drones, we use cameras, we go out into the field and we document exactly what we see. We bring that information back into the office and do our research from there. But now we're going to look at some maps so that you understand what makes things legal and illegal. Anyone who was on the webinar um, Thursday night uh, has seen some of these maps, but there are others here that you didn't see. What you're looking at here is an ancient uh, situation. Yes, uh, this is the map, and amazingly enough, this is the map that was the basis for the mandate for Palestine and for the, um, the San Remo Conference, all the things that give the Jewish people their rights to the land of Israel. And if you look closely at it, you will see that it is on both sides of the Jordan, this pink area. What year is it? This map was, was created by the British uh, Exploration Society, and it was presented to the San Remo Conference, uh, and eventually was the basis for the mandate for Palestine, We're talking 1919, 1922, and then again uh, was finalized when the mandate was, uh, was adopted, was accepted by the British. This is the map that served as the basis for all of that. And it is a map based on the biblical division between, among the tribes of Israel, of the land of Israel. Both sides of the Jordan, because if you read your Bible properly, you will realize that two and a half tribes lived on this side. Yes? yes. Reuben, Gad, and half of Menashe lived on that side of the Jordan. The rest of the tribes came into this side. Notice where it goes all the way up to. Metra, all the way down, and did not include the area that was settled by the Philistines, house, the, the, the Gaza Strip, essentially. Right? But the pink area was the area set aside by the nations of the world. This was what was, pre what was presented and what was accepted, ratified by the, nation, by the eight powers the principal powers, the victorious powers after the First World War, this was supposed to be what the land of Israel, what the state of Israel would look like. Next slide. This is a map, although it's in Arabic, this was presented by the Jewish representatives at San Remo. The San Remo Conference heard testimony uh, from all of the uh, peoples involved the Jewish representatives gave this map as what they were asking for, for the national home to be called Israel. You'll notice that it's almost identical to the other map, to the British map, both sides of the Jordan, but not beyond. The dotted line that you see here is the Hijaz Railway, and that was essentially the border that, they, that the Jewish representatives asked for. Now you would say, okay, they can ask for anything they want. These same borders were excluded from what the Arab representatives requested as the Arab national homeland. The Arab representatives accepted this map as the Jewish national homeland. The powers that convened in San Remo incorporated these borders as the Jewish national homeland. Unfortunately, and this is gonna seem strange to you, next slide, 
the British extended that territory significantly. So you see the purple line, that demarcates what the Jews had asked for. The British added all of that territory on. Why did they do that? Two reasons. The main reason was it wasn't that they wanted to give the Jews more. It's that they wanted to give the French less. <laughs> that shouldn't surprise anyone who knows the relationship between the British and the French. The French had the mandates in the surrounding area. So anything that the British took over, the French didn't get. The only thing that they gave them at the end of the day was all the way up at the top of the Golan Heights, the small area that we see in the bubble there, the Conetra area more or less, they ceded to the French mandate. Uh, but all of this section was added on. Why was it added on? Not only because of their geopolitical interests against the French, but also because it made it easier for the British to do what they did immediately after the borders were created, is they changed them. <laughs> they locked off nearly 80% of this territory that was set aside for the Jewish mm -hmm. national homeland and created Transjordan, Jordan. Yes, the state of Jordan as we know. Why they did that was because they had a deal with the Hashemites. The Hashemites uh, helped defeat the Turkish Empire in World War I. They had all sorts of other uh, arrangements with them, had made promises to them, which they never publicized. No one knew about it. The problem also began when, although the Hashemites weren't supposed to be here, uh, when the French finally made it to Damascus, they found one of the Hashemites there, Abdallah, had installed himself and declared himself king. Uh, so the French routed him roundly, defeated his army, crushed his army, and he was not happy. So the British, in order to appease him, said, okay, don't worry. The French don't want you in Damascus. We will give you your own situation here. And they locked off nearly 80% of the, of the territory that had been agreed upon by all of the p world powers uh, for a Jewish national homeland, and they created what is the first two-state solution. They took one piece of territory, divided it unevenly, and created two states. The Arab state of Transjordan, now Jordan, and the Jewish state, which was to become the state of Israel. This was not allowed. It was actually illegal. Uh, under the terms of all mandates, they were not allowed to change the borders. They did all sorts of funny things by changing the language of the mandate. So if you have two different versions of the mandate, it's Article 25 of the British Mandate that they simply rewrote in order to allow them to do this. Uh, and the nations didn't complain, and the Jews didn't complain. They had no choice. Remember? Uh, they said at this point, Jews are being persecuted in Europe. They need a place to go. If we're going to quibble, they're going to die. So we take this uh, rather than this. Next slide. They took essentially this. The British were at it still. Uh, go back again. Sorry. Uh, the British didn't give up here. They created the borders, as you know, this line became the border. And then that wasn't enough. There were still rioting. There was still bloodshed. The Arabs weren't happy that the Jews were there at all, even though they got 80%. Uh, so the British essentially concocted this uh, map, the partition plan of 1947, where they wanted to once again divide the remaining 22% uh, among and make another two-state solution. This would be a two two-state solution. Um, the Arabs rejected this out of hand. They wanted all or nothing. And I have a news flash for you. They still want all or nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we'll get to that. Okay, so this is what the map looked like, as you know, at the end of the War of Independence. Even though, go back again, even though the Arabs rejected this, uh, when Israel declared its independence, the Jordanians uh, joined the other Arab armies and attacked Israel and 
managed to take that piece of territory on the west of the Jordan against the law, an act of aggression, an occupation, an eventual annexation that were never recognized by the nations of the world except for two countries. Once again, the British, for the same reasons that they created Jordan, they supported Jordan's illegal annexation of the territory to the west of the Jordan. And the other country was Pakistan. <laughs> okay. Uh, Pakistan had its own issues with India, it had its own uh, problems, it still does. Doesn't, doesn't worry me that much. Okay, so all the other countries, including the members of the Arab League, condemn Jordan's occupation and annexation of land to the west of the Jordan. Jordan, for its part, decided that they should try to somehow rationalize their, their presence on the west of the Jordan, crossing the internationally recognized border, and they created a new name for that territory, the West Bank. That name was just invented by the, by the Jordanians in order to explain, in order to try to create a narrative that this piece of territory was part of their country, which it never had been, and geographically, historically, culturally, just had nothing to do with it, but it was, it was occupied illegally by the Jordanians. So that's what the, the map looked like for 19 years. 19 years. Next, the next Isn't slide. Isn't it true that they were very interested in that territory because it was a lot easier to grow crops on the West Bank than elsewhere in Jordan? It's just as easy on the East Bank. It's the exact, uh, okay. actually, if you ask the Haredi communities right now, as Shemitah is over, where their vegetables came from during the whole Shemitah year, they'll show you exactly where. Right on the other side of the Jordan. Uh, it, it, that's exactly where they... Anyway, so the map looked that way until 1967. And as you know, 1967, there was a very big war. Once again, but go back, sorry. Some, some interesting, some important information that I don't want to leave out. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in this uh, resolution, but the line that is delineating that uh, occupied and annexed piece of territory is green. It was drawn with a green pen on the maps that were used to create an armistice at the end of the war. Not an international border. It was stressed over and over and over again that these are not borders and have no political significance. It was a completely military arrangement. They had arrived at a spot where they were going to stop fighting and nothing more. Uh, so that's the green line, and the armistice means that the Jordanians gave their uh, commitment not to go beyond that line uh, in hostile act. However, they violated that agreement, and in the next war, in 1967, they joined the other Arab armies and tried to, to destroy Israel, wipe Israel off the map. I will point out that they didn't like us a whole lot when Israel wasn't in the West Bank, quote unquote. When they were occupying Judea and Samaria, they were still trying to wipe us out and still trying to delegitimize the entire existence of a Jewish national state uh, in, this, in the Middle East. So it wasn't because there was any Jewish occupation of the West Bank. They just didn't want us there at all. In any case, in 1967, Israel managed to push the Jordanians back across the border and liberate the territory that had always been internationally recognized as part of the mandated borders of the state of Israel, right? Liberated, not occupied, not annexed, not anything else, returned to the originally intended borders of the state of Israel. Now, that is a crucial piece of information, and the people outside who are using their megaphones to try to dr drown us out right now refuse to understand this extremely basic point. Israel cannot be considered an occupier of this territory because it was returned to its own borders and because the Jordanians were never recognized 
as the sovereign in, interna in, the international, in international law by the international community. So you can't be an occupier if A, the territory on which you're standing belonged to you to begin with, B, if the people that you took it from, that you liberated it from, were illegally in the territory. Um, and there's just no reason why uh, Israel can possibly be considered illegally occupying these territories. But in 1967, Israel made a fateful decision. The, the problem wasn't the territory. The problem was the people living there. Because during the time that the Jordanians occupied this territory, they did everything they could to flood the territory with population so that they could keep control of it. So they moved people in, which is illegal under the Geneva Conventions. They encouraged people to move there uh, from all over the place. And people did move there from all over the place because there was an economy there, there were all sorts of other benefits to moving there, and there wasn't a whole lot of good living anywhere else in the Arab world. People began to live there. There were people there before, nowhere near as many as there were by the time Israel returned to these areas in 1967. But Israel said, okay, we're going to hold everything in abeyance. We're going to put it on hold, we're gonna put it on freeze until we can negotiate a political solution for the status of the people living there. Because 10 minutes ago, they were enemy, hostile combatants. They are not culturally part of uh, mainland <coughs> Israel, meaning they are foreign. And while the Jordanians occupied that area, they actually ethnically cleansed the entire, uh, all of their holdings, both in Jerusalem and in the entire Judea and Samaria, chased out all the Jews, massacred them, took them prisoner, uh, and it became against the law for Jews to live in the areas that were occupied by Jordan. Uh, it became against the law, and that law, believe it or not, is still on the books for Jews to purchase land or to hold title or deeds to any property in Judea and Samaria or the parts of Jerusalem that were taken by the Jordanians. So Israel had this situation, and they said, okay, there's, there's Arabs living here. They don't necessarily want to be living uh, in Israel. Let's negotiate a resolution, a political <coughs> resolution, for what happens with these people. So temporarily, we will make believe that this is an occupied territory. We will um, apply voluntarily the rules set out by the Geneva Conventions, particularly the Fourth Geneva Convention having to do with people in an occupied area. And we will administer the territory that way voluntarily, <clears throat> temporarily, until we can negotiate with the other parties involved a resolution to these people's political status. That is the situation that persists until today. And that is an impossible situation. And I repeat, a self-imposed <clears throat> situation. Israel decided to behave this way. And once you don't say, this is mine, you say, it's sort of mine, or it should be mine, but it's not yet mine, or maybe it's mine, or maybe it's partially mine. You open the door to what's happening outside right now. You open the door to claims that we aren't really supposed to be there. You open the door to claims that we are doing something wrong by the very fact that the ethnic cleansing is being reversed that Jews are now permitted to be there, to live there, to build communities there, and to consider themselves Israeli citizens with equal rights. That's what's distressing to the BDS movement and to the anti-Israel forces that are trying to change the map again. This, this again, this is unprecedented in the history of the world. No other case has a country that managed to liberate its own territory been expected to behave in this way? In no other case has a country that won a war actually returned territory to the people who attacked. Israel has done that. 
uh, the vast majority of the, of the territory taken in the Six Day War has already been given away. Uh, I'll remind you that the entire Sinai, more than 80% of the, of the land that changed hands as a result of the Six Day War has been handed back already. That's a topic for another day. Uh, and this is what the map continues to look like, or continued to look like, until this. This is the Oslo map. This is the day the Oslo Accords were signed. It's a very difficult picture for me to look at for many, many reasons. But this is what the map that was created in 1995 looks like. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know, and you hear all this jargon in the newspapers all the time, you hear Area A, Area B, Area C, West Bank, Judea and Samaria. Most people don't really know what all that is. So this is what's going to explain it to you, and then we're going to move further. The bright red areas, I apologize to anyone in the room who is colorblind from what I understand. It's very difficult to see the difference between these shades, but it doesn't really matter. The, the red areas, which people who are colorblind apparently see as brown, uh, are areas that were ceded to the, the entity created in the <coughs> Oslo framework known as the Palestinian Authority. The PLO was uh, <clears throat> encouraged to create a national assembly, essentially, uh, as uh, the administrator towards self-rule for the Palestinian Arab people who were still living on the west of the Jordan. And, he, and, and, and who were not yet Israeli citizens. So, area A, the brighter red colors, uh, were the urban population centers in which Arabs had been living at that time. That includes the cities you've heard of, such as Bethlehem, Jericho, Nablus, or Shrem, uh, big cities, uh, Arab cities. The, the sort of maroon uh, sections are area B. Area B were the rural population centers in which Arabs were living. Large towns or villages, but not really cities. Mm -hmm. uh, those things were placed under Palestinian authorities' civilian authority. That means that every aspect of a person's life in those communities, in those areas, was now taken over by the Palestinian Authority and was their sole responsibility. What does that include? Health, education, welfare, infrastructure, building permits, all of the things that you need to live as a citizen anywhere, right? All of those matters were placed under the Palestinian Authority's control. The difference between areas A and B was not only the, the style of living in these places, but also that uh, area A was given to full Palestinian security control as well. The Oslo Accords also created the Palestinian police force and the Israeli government gave the Palestinian police weapons and training uh, so that they could keep the peace and the Israeli army would no longer have contact with the civilians living in these areas. Area B was the same, except that Israel maintained peripheral security control over these areas. Um, and what does that mean? It means that if Israel had to go in, uh, look, let's, let's phrase it this way. We see that these areas are essentially islands in this larger yellow area. The yellow area is area C. That is the area that is under full Israeli jurisdiction. And that's the area we're talking about today. The area under, the, the, these areas were bubbles, purposely created so as not to be contiguous. Because once they are contiguous and they're under self-rule, essentially you have created a state and that will be um, essentially irrevocable. What was supposed to be the next stage after these areas were set aside was a negotiated resolution between Israel and the Palestinian Authority as to exactly how to make, what political arrangements would be made to make life for the people living in these red areas uh, better and what political rights they would have. 
in terms of personal rights, their personal rights were all placed in under the jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority. And then the question was, what political rights would they have? Would they be citizens of the Palestinian state? Would they be citizens of Jordan in some sort of confederation? Would they be subsumed and into Israel, given Israeli citizenship? All these questions were supposed to be negotiated. But that didn't happen. So what did happen? This is how the map should look. And again, I'm going to give you now some of the maps that we actually work with. This is, this is, uh, this is a Regafim map. Um, this is the, a topographical map of, of all of Judea and Samaria. Notice the, the size. It's about 6 million dunams. Next slide. Areas A and B were originally set aside, constituting approximately 40% of the entire territory, and area C, approximately 60% of the territory. Israeli communities today, as they were 10 years ago, these green dots constitute less than 1% of the total area of Judea and Samaria. So all of the screaming and yelling that you hear in international media about Israeli expansionism and Israeli annexation of Judea and Samaria, it accounts for less than 1% of the entire territory. And that figure has not changed over the last decade. Next. In 2009, we found, we simply counted, we took aerial photographs, and counted all the structures that were in area C, the areas under Israeli control. Now, why did we start in 2009? 2009, I don't have it here, show it to you. In 2009, this was about three and a half years after Israel ceded the last piece, no, I don't have it. You can download from the internet. Uh, after Israel ceded the last piece of territory under the Y Plantation Accords to the Palestinian Authority, the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, Salam Fayyad, announced that the Oslo process was over. No longer binding. Dead. Finished. Since that time, the State of Israel has pretended either that he didn't say it or that he didn't mean it or that we didn't hear it, or that he, they are not actually practically acting on it. All of those things are untrue. Since 2009, since the announcement of the, of the Fayyad plan, the Palestinian Authority has carried out a massive program of de facto annexation of Area C. The Fayyad plan essentially uh, announced that a a state of Palestine would be built in all of Judea and Samaria, and the only thing that was left to do was to take over Area C, since Areas A and B were already under Palestinian Authority control. So how do you do that? So what you're seeing here is how they're doing it. And I'm going to explain three major tactics of how they're doing it. Yes, well, these are old figures. In 2009, we found that the, um, the number of illegal structures had doubled, 60,000. But since that time, it's far worse. And I'll show you the, the data on that in a minute. Yes. I, this, actually, we just prepared this. I didn't even have time to translate this into English yet. But you can figure it out for yourselves. Um, at present, as of last month, we counted the number of illegal structures, Arab structures in Area C that are taking up space, annexing the territory. There are over 81,000 illegal Arab structures in Area C. Now, I'll stress again, there are no Jewish, there is no Jewish presence at all in areas A and B. They are ethnically cleansed of all Jews. All the Jewish communities are in Area C, and all of this, this entire program, is to take over Area C. So, 
In Area C, there are 81,317 illegal Arab-built structures at present. But people will tell you, and you'll read about it any day of the week in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in Haaretz, the Israelis are building illegally. So you can't actually, it's the pot calling the kettle black. You know, you, if you're building illegally, they're building illegally. Well, the grand total of illegal structures in the Jewish sector in Area C is 4,382, grand total. That's less than the number built in the last 18 months alone by the Arabs. And the enforcement rate against illegal Jewish structures is 100%. And the enforcement rate, obviously, as you can see, if they've achieved those sorts of numbers against Arab construction is nearly zero. And that's what we do. We try to force the government to enforce the law equally and universally. It's not like we say, please ignore these and deal with those. No, we are not in favor of illegal construction anywhere because we don't want to live in chaos. Now, the other thing that I'll point out is that, yes. What constitutes Israeli construction and what constitutes Arab construction? Okay, so that's a very good question. What I want to point out is that of this 4,382 illegal Jewish-built structures, only 400 of them are outside of existing legal community. Meaning, if my house, which is legal, built legally with permits, etc., if I build a room without a permit, that's one of these. But that's not the case with those. We're talking about distinct structures. If in Givat Ze'ev, where I live, someone builds an extra, a building, it's, it hasn't changed the footprint of Jewish presence in Area C, but it is illegal. That's not the case with these. And soon I'll show you the map and you'll understand the significance of all this. Because the problem isn't only the quantity of structures that have been built, it's the quality. They are strategically placed in order to create contiguity between those bubbles of areas A and B, in order to create a state that stretches from one end of the country to the other, right? So and another thing which I'll translate for you here is we also uh, calculated population density. So population density for Israelis in Judea and Samaria and population density for Arabs in Judea and Samaria. We build up. We build to use the land resources normally. We build within legal uh, permitted areas. They build to take over territory. So they're dispersed and their dispersal is tremendous. Okay, so that's just the graph of uh, what we've got. When we counted the structures, uh, we also counted the territory. The amount of territory taken over by illegal construction mm -hmm. and legal construction, everything together. What we discovered is that that 60-40 split between Israel having 60% of Judea and Samaria and the Palestinian Authority having 40% has now shifted the other way. The Palestinian Authority now controls 60% and Israel only 40%. We have lost huge amounts of land. Yes? Why is any construction in Area C illegal if Area C is supposed to be for Jews, right? Area C? Uh -huh. So why is construction in Area C considered illegal? If you don't have a building permit, it's illegal. You need a building permit. But well, why couldn't they get a permit if it's area C? Why didn't they try? <laughs> well, we're gonna talk about building permits in a minute. Next slide. This is, ah, that's the front cover of the Fayad plan. If anyone's interested in reading it cover to cover, you can simply Google those words on the internet and take your own copy. It's called Ending the Occupation, Establishing the State. That is Salam Fayad announcing the, the, uh, the plan. 
launching the plan, and this is presenting it to the representative of the European Union. Now, the European Union should have taken this plan and said, well, you have a plan to build illegally, to annex territory, to unilaterally create a state, and to completely abrogate your obligations under the internationally uh, witnessed Oslo Accords, which <coughs> constitute international law until something else takes their place, right? So the European Union should have looked at all this and said, that's not allowed. We will not allow you to violate the terms of the agreement. Instead, next slide, it took about 13 months for the European Union to announce its full support of the Fayad plan and to begin pouring money into this project. They are actively involved in supporting further uh, Palestinian <coughs> control over Area C. This is illegal. That's what makes it illegal. International law is created by internationally witnessed, signed treaties. The Oslo Accord is a prime example. This is a violation of international law. Okay, so what you have, you can, any of you want to, you can download this from the internet just like I did. This is, it's called Spatial Plans for Palestinian Communities in Area C of the West Bank. The European Union and all of its member states, and you can look at every single page here and it'll tell you which countries are funding the planning and development of each area in Area C for the Palestinians. They planned out the entire area C, all of Judea and Samaria, and now they are systematically going about developing according to these plans. They've planned, and they'll tell you on each page, how much of this area is presently occupied by a Jewish community, how much of this area is presently occupied by archeological sites, how much of this plans, planned area is presently occupied by IDF bases. It's, it's all out in the open. I just downloaded this from the internet. And the Europeans know that they're funding things that are illegal. They actually build into the contracts for each of these development plans money to cover demolition costs and legal representation because they know Israel's completely within its rights to knock these things down and to chase out of the country anyone involved in them as persona non grata that are violating the law, but they don't. Next slide. And the question is, why don't they? Ah, yeah. we'll get to that. <laughs> yes. Who gives the EU authority to do this within Israel? Nothing. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Because this Which is an mean? Asian country. The international community that the PA should have gone to if they wanted to do this would be the UN. No. Uh, no. Why not? We're Nobody can do it. But the, the UN Charter. Obviously not, but the logical one, if you want to, if you want to do this type of stuff, you don't go to the EU who has no, no, no. Um, authority <laughs> within an Asian country. That's what the, the EU has the authority country. anywhere it wants to, and it has no authority anywhere. I'm, I'm Neither does the United Nations. The basic principles of the United Nations Charter are non-intervention. The United Nations and the European Union at, at the, the most basic concept of those bodies is that they will never violate the sovereignty of any state. Except, Israel. Oh, we forgot <laughs> that one. Yeah. So, there are methods, there are three main methods that I want to run through some slides quickly to show you uh, the main methods that are being employed by the Palestinian Authority that are being supported by massive international funding and legal and diplomatic support that are changing the map and actually actualizing this plan, this, the Fayad plan, for de facto establishment of a Palestinian state in the <coughs> Empire. So these are the three that I'm going to show you this evening. They're the three main tactics that are employed. One is the strategic illegal construction that I have showed you just on the map briefly. The other, agricultural land seizure. This takes advantage of a loophole in the law that is still in force in this area, Ottoman land law, which enables people to use a piece of land, even if it doesn't belong to them, 
for agricultural purposes for a certain amount of time and thereby gain rights to the land. The Supreme Court of the State of Israel has decided, in a very famous case, that only Arabs can benefit from this loophole in Ottoman land law. The third tactic that we'll look at is land survey and registration, which is a bit esoteric, but I'll try to explain it as we go along. So I'm going to run through some slides quickly just to give you an idea of how. Okay, illegal construction. As I showed you, it's funded and protected by European governments and organizations. The pattern of illegal construction of outposts has been repeated countless times, drawing vulnerable populations to tr strategic spots by providing reliable sources of water and building schools as anchors for new communities. Next, and I'll show you what this looks like. We began to see this all through the area surrounding, cutting Jerusalem off to the east, to its eastern border, in an area known as E1, or the Adumim region. Very innocent looking water tankers, but we began to see them in desolate areas. Nobody lived there, and all of a sudden these water tankers appeared all over the territory. And right wherever there were water tankers, Bedouin populations collected and stayed. And then immediately, what you see here are prefab units, houses, provided by, EU. by the EU. That is the EU symbol. All of those are illegal, they're a flagrant violation of international law, and they are unique. There is no such thing anywhere else in the world. The European Union does not build, it does not provide housing anywhere else in the world, but right here. Including in the, in the EU. Correct. And this is what it looks like up close. What you see in the background are a few examples of the schools. I'm going to show you more examples of them. But all of these structures sport this sign in order to give them diplomatic immunity. So we go out into the field and we take pictures of them. Yes? Is it at all possible that those are just forgeries? No. So the no, no, no. When the, when Israel actually the, uh, yes, yeah. when when Israel knocks one down, they get an official complaint and they get threats of being charged with war crimes in the ICC. It's not a it's not a fake. And the countries that take part in this and build illegal structures, there's a consortium of eight countries that actually threaten to sue Israel for compensation when it knocks down illegally built structures. And last year, the final state of Israel, at a certain point, Belgium, France, Switzerland, and they were all in on the game. And finally, last year, Israel said to them, you're not being funny. And we, there's, you have absolutely nothing to talk about, so go and tell somebody else. We're not interested. Go, you want to sue us for knocking down an illegal structure? Let's see you try. So they stopped. But Israel's not forceful enough. Yes? So the four animals that, you know, that uh, Israel encourages people in, in the galas to buy, you know, mm -hmm. like four animals of land. Okay. The, and you've never heard of that? No. Okay. <laughs> so there are different organizations that say, well, you know, get a piece, own a piece of Israel for oh, four animals of land. It's a really good I'm marketing just ploy. I'm curious if you're aware of that. Don't fall for it. Uh, <laughs> I'll talk to you about it later. Okay. Next. Uh, let, me, let me explain why this is a, an issue. Judea and Samaria, listen to this carefully because it's gonna be very hard for you to get your heads around. All the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, all of them were built on state land. Land that was never owned by anyone. State land that was state land under the Jordanians, under the British, under the Ottoman Empire, empty. That is why it was declared state land, right? Jewish communities within little Israel, on the, on, the, on the right side of the Green Line, were built on the remains of pre prior communities. Beersheba, Yafo, Akko, Lod, Jerusalem. There were populations there, some of them Arab. That is not the case in Judea and Samaria. They were built on empty land. Yes. 
There is no such thing as the green line. Sorry. Okay. Why do we keep referencing that? Hold By on. Referencing that, we are acknowledging Be them. No, we're acknowledging the law. That is what we have right now. Until that law is changed, we operate within the parameters of the law. We are all for changing that law. We insist that that has to be changed. We insist that Israeli law has to be applied to this territory for every reason. And also for the benefit of the non-Jewish people living there because the system of law that exists there now is chaos. It's not a system and it's not law. We'll get to it. Just, I wanna okay. run through some pictures. Can I ask? Yes. But if this is our land, why don't we just go with the bulldozers and evict all those houses that don't the that they need to buy? We can. We should. Well, why would, don't we do it? Ah. I mean, because you the, want to why, be nice Why guys. don't we do it? I mean, there's nobody in the world that was nice to us except for the chairman that killed six million Jews. Yes. All the other countries throughout history. Yes. We why have don't to go we there it? with the bulldozer and level the land. So, and everybody that's not registered on government uh, plan, give him 60 days or 90 days or whatever they think is reasonable. And Israel can, by all legal rights, do that. Israel has not done that. And there are various reasons for it. Number one is because be nice. there's a ma massive international pressure. And Israel has trade agreements, and Israel has security agreements, and Israel has military agreements, and Israel has other issues. This isn't the only issue. And I'm going I, to show you an example. One second. I'm going to show you this example and explain how this gets, how we've gotten here. What you're looking at here is a picture of, this is Mitzpah Yericho, essentially. Um, this piece of land is very, very famous now. Not for a good reason. If you Google the words Khan al Ahmar, this is it. And we're going to look at Khan al Ahmar. Khan al Ahmar is a case, we call it the flagship case of the Fayyad plan. We've been in court over the Fayyad plan for almost 13 years. <laughs> look at it carefully. Not very impressive. Keep going. Yeah, the, that's route one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. See that thing, something's starting to happen? Yeah. Keep going. This is what it looks like. This is what it looked like about three years ago. Now it's actually double in size. Six times we went to court over this outpost. Six times. The Supreme Court of Israel agreed that it is A, illegal, B, must be removed for both security reasons, safety reasons, the benefit of the people who are living there, I will stress, without running water, electricity, sewage, on the main highway, this is Route 1, uh, and are being forced to stay there. By whom, you may ask. Each time they go to the court, they are represented, these people are represented against their will by the Palestinian Authority and the European Union, who have absolutely forbidden them to reach any compromise with the State of Israel. This is the alternative situation that the State of Israel created in order to relocate those people. This means that they develop these plots of land put in sewage, electricity, running water, paved roads. It is right outside of Abu Dis, which is a, an Arab city under the Palestinian Authority's control. Israel invested about, about 80 million shekel. The night before, the people who are living on that side of the road were supposed to be relocated to here. Counselor of Germany, Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. picked up the phone from her plane and called Prime Minister Netanyahu and said, if you touch Khan al-Athmar while I am on my way to Israel, I will turn the plane around and I will go home and I will not come back. And I thought, win-win, great. There's only one problem. Angela Merkel was on her way to Israel to discuss the sale of nuclear submarines for Israel's Navy. So Netanyahu had a choice. 
nuclear submarines relocate around 50 Bedouin squatters. Mm. Mm. You know, when you're the prime minister of a country, there are other issues involved. Israel could take a bulldozer, go in there and knock it all down, and tell those people, go wherever you're going, you're not our problem, you're not our citizens, you're the responsibility of the Palestinian Authority, you don't have to, we don't have any responsibility for you. But Israel doesn't do that. And if Israel did do that, A, we would have no secure, we would have no nuclear submarines from Germany, B, we would be in the international court, and all of the IDF officers who cannot travel to any other country because they'll be arrested <coughs> for war crimes would have a problem. So we have a lot of other pressures involved here. I'm going to just hold you questions for two minutes, and we're going to look at a few other maps. This is a map that we created a few years ago. It's the same map of Judea and Samaria. You've seen it before. Area A, B, and C. What you see in addition is what we mapped out, and this is going back at least seven years. Now the situation is even worse, but the purple dots that are being hidden are illegal, um, what are now being called in international parlance herder communities. These are illegal outposts in which Bedouin have been uh, collected by the Palestinian Authority in order to take over <coughs> this land. The green dots on top of them, and you'll notice that they are strategically placed to choke Jerusalem and to create bridges between existing bubbles of areas A and B along major highways. Those are the places where we identified European Union involvement of 80% or more, meaning 80% of the structures in each of those green dots have European Union stickers on them which means that if the European Union didn't create those outposts, they wouldn't be there. Where would these people be? They would be here. They would be here. They would be here. But the Palestinian Authority moves them here in order to take over land. Next slide. This is what some of them look like. It's not a secret who's doing this. See if you can find your country on one of these posters. Ireland, I don't even know what this one is. Denmark, Sweden, France, Belgium. Up there we have Abu Dhabi even. You mean Canada's not, Canada's not in that? UK, Canada's not on this. Canada has yes. a, there's yes. another thing there's going there. on with Canada. No, we have a great one with Canada. We actually... Um, we're trying to sue the Canadian government about something else. Oh. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I don't want to run out of time, so I want to run through the slides a little bit more quickly. I don't want to hold you here all night since I can talk till tomorrow. <laughs> Keep going. Um, it's not just that they send money. They send people. They send equipment. They send experts. They send engineers. They send city planners. This is what it looks like. This is how they create a humanitarian crisis. They put people in the middle of nowhere in these tin prefab units, and then they decry the fact that people are living in areas under Israeli jurisdiction without sewage, running water, and electricity. But they put them there yes. without sewage, running water, and electricity. Yeah. They should dry up. That would be the best solution for them. Nope. Keep going. Okay, this is another a model. And this is just something I thought I, some of you would find interesting. This is a, a map of illegal structures just outside of the community of Efrat. Hmm. Uh, I don't know how many of you have visited Efrat, but if you look out the back fence, every year, more and more and more, they have paved roads, they have electricity. I encourage you to go on our website and read our most recent case. It's about the what's called the JDEC, the Jerusalem District Electric Company. Essentially, Israeli taxpayers, without knowing it, are paying, are paying for all of the electricity that is enabling all of this illegal construction. Hmm. And we never knew it until Rigovin figured it out. 
It's, a, it's an interesting story. Read about it on our website. So this is what it looks like in practice from the back fence of Efrat. Yes. I'm sorry, just one thing, just, I'm sorry to do this. Um, the protesters are still out front, but they, it's rumored that they're going to leave soon. I just heard Naomi say she's going to rush through the slides. If it's okay for me to say, don't rush through the slides because they'll probably be gone if you just talk a little bit longer. <laughs> that would, that would probably I have a flight tomorrow at noon. I can keep going till then. So, Naomi, sorry, we didn't hear. The, the protesters are, are they're, outside, they're yeah. still out, but they're uh, breaking. So, so we'll take it a little uh, bit. So what? <laughs> uh, I'm not good, so I'm not concerned either. Not either. Um, just so that you know, uh, from one of these structures right over here, about three months ago, um, they began shooting at one of the houses on the bottom street of Efrat. Someone I know, his name is Michael Sperber, and his house was just totally shot up with automatic weapon fire. These are not something that were placed on the, on the ground overnight. These are something that everyone can see being built. They're massive brick and mortar structures, there are roads being laid, there's electricity. This is between Ephrat and Bethlehem. It is changing the map completely. On the outer edge of all of this is Route 60, the main thoroughfare that serves all of Judea and Samaria. The civil administration has done absolutely nothing to stop this. Okay, it's just more pictures of the same. That's on the road. Keep going. You see that it is organized and it is whatever. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna just talk about this very quickly because at a certain point after the Oslo Accords, Israel's genius idea was to create bypass routes so that Israel, Israelis wouldn't have to travel near the areas that were ceded to the Palestinian Authority. So they created bypass routes. This one is called the Chalchul Bypass Route, Route 60's uh, route was changed somewhat in order to avoid the very large Palestinian city of Khalkhul. Um, anyone who travels to the South Hebron area, uh, to Carmel, Maon, Otniel, all of those places goes on this road. Khalkhul bypass road. Now look at what it looks like. See the green dot? When the Khalkhul bypass road, uh, that, that's 1999, we identified one unpermitted structure out there. Next slide. Now look at the red. That's already what we found in 2008. Right? Keep going. Okay. In other words, it's now on both sides of the road, all the way around. And the bypass road now requires a bypass road. And it's all over Yehuda and Shalom, all through Judea and Samaria. We have the exact same phenomenon. Anywhere Israel simply avoided was lost. If you don't establish a presence and maintain control of the area, it's lost. This has now been reclassified, parts of this have been reclassified by the civil administration and are no longer Area C. We've lost them. This is an area that is very, very famous now. It's called Masafar Yata. You'll read about it in all the newspapers. It's a huge thing. The civil administration allowed Bedouin, who were sleeping in caves during certain seasons, to sleep in these natural caves in the IDF firing zone. This is 917. Um, Jewish Queen of Carmel is right here. Next slide. As soon as the civil administration allowed them to stay within those polygons, <laughs> they began to build outside of the polygons in order to try to connect the polygons. Next. Keep going. Okay, that's what it looks like now. Uh, and as you can see, this, all this green, is the Y Plantation Nature Reserves. 3% uh, of the territory was ceded in a, in a subsequent agreement after Oslo in order to balance the territory between uh, the Jews and the Arabs. And this was, it's a nature reserve and was, uh, and is a no construction zone. Mm -hmm. Massive construction, massive environmental damage, 
uh, probably irreparable at this point, but if you go in any day of the week, you will see throughout the entire nature reserve piles, piles of building materials dumped there by trucks with big UN symbols on the side. The UN comes, dumps building materials, and goes away. Bedouin come from Yaza, and just they have free land, they have free building materials, and they know they're going to get free electricity and water, and they just build, and that's it. It doesn't take much. Okay, we'll go through this. This is Susia. It's a very, very famous case. We're back in court with this now. As you can see, in 1999, there was absolutely nothing there. Keep going. 2006, the first structures begin to appear. Keep going. Yeah. We now have a very, very famous internationally championed case called Nawaja. They gave it its own name. And uh, Israel is being accused of trying to destroy the ancient, ancient community of Nawaja, which didn't exist in 1999. <laughs> <laughs> this is just quickly a map of all of the illegal schools. I did mention that one of the tactics is schools. Um, these are all, all these yellow dots are illegal schools built by the Palestinian Authority throughout Judea and Samaria, Area C. You'll notice uh, they are strategically placed. We have a full report on just on the schools. We tracked 100 illegal schools in Area C. They are used to create communities, not to serve communities. And they are called Al-Tahadi schools, which means resistance. So they're there for political reasons. They're generally placed uh, in places that are less than 200 meters away from existing schools in areas A and B. Uh, they are not serving any need. The population, the um, classroom density in the Palestinian Authority is among the lowest. It's lower than in Israel. It's lower than in Jewish communities in area C. It's lower than in Jordan. What is it? Um, it's in the report. I don't want to misquote the numbers. On our website, you can see the whole report. I called it Easy as ABC. Um, and it is about the use of schools as a tactic for territorial takeover. Yeah. Uh, you have some yellow dots around Jerusalem, but they're outside of Judea and Samaria. Those are no, um, they're, they're, some, they're illegal, but they're in Jerusalem. They're, built, they're Palestinian Authority schools built in Jerusalem. It's insane. Right, OK, so now I'm going to run through quickly uh, some pictures of this use of agricultural, that agricultural, the loophole in Ottoman land law that allows agricultural takeovers of the territory. Yeah. Keep going. This is what it looks like in practice. This uh, road, when, we, when they first started paving it, we went to court. It is now eight and a half kilometers long, fully paved, illegal. Uh, in a very, very strategic area that takes up the only place that Eastern Gush Etzion can be connected to Western Gush Etzion. This is what you find if you go out and look at all this planting. Each of these trees is labeled. They know exactly who's paying for it. They know exactly when it was planted. Uh, and it's being planted by the state of Palestine. And all this is in Area C. Naomi, can I ask you a question? Sure. Why is it so important for the European Union to have the Arabs take over Area C. Like, what's in it for them? Like, why do they want, why are they pushing that so much? They're and did sense. Israel do anything when they agreed to the Fayyad plan? Did we protest in the beginning when they, they signed illegally? Well, Canada, what? Canada. Canada, yeah. Canada's up to their necks in this. Why are the Europeans, they don't like us. Why? Because yeah. they're Jews. Jew haters. Yeah. yeah. So this whole thing is just anti-Semitism. I can't think of any other reason. If anyone else can, I'd love to hear it. And when, when Fayette first went to the European Union and said, OK, Oslo's dead, and they eventually signed this, so even though they had signed the Oslo, mm -hmm. did Israel do anything? Did they go no. to them and protest? No. No. Why not? Because Rigovin didn't exist to scream yeah. yell, I guess. I, don't, I, I have no other answer. Why? Israel doesn't really want to take on the entire European Union. It doesn't want to take on the Canadian government. It doesn't want to take on the American government. It doesn't want to take on the United Nations. It doesn't want to take on Germany, Belgium, France, Switzerland, mm -hmm. Ireland, Wales, <laughs> Great Britain, Denmark, Norway, all at once. 
No. She should make a common toilet for them. No, all they're doing it because they don't like it. None of those countries like us. Correct. Well, they're right. pointing. No, 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 like us. Us. no, no that's right. One second, keep going. Okay, this is all, these are all from a, uh, a UAWC report. UAWC is the Union of Agricultural Work Committees. It's one of the six Palestinian NGOs that we were instrumental in having blacklisted um, and internationally sanctioned as terrorist affiliates. We saw what they were doing on the ground and we began to look into this uh, organization and realized that all of their officers were also officers in the PFLP. And all of these other NGOs, the PFLP is George Habash's Palestinian Liberation Front, etc., which is an internationally sanctioned terrorist organization. It's on every blacklist. Uh, they are the main hijackers, murderers, terrorists. And all of these NGOs are staffed by the exact same people. So we finally managed to raise the cry. Unfortunately, too late, because these people, the, the chief financial officer and the, one of the directors of the UAWC actually carried out the terrorist attack that took the life of a 17-year-old Israeli girl and wounded the rest of her family while they were on a tour uh, in, of, my, of a natural spring, Pesach, two and a half years ago. We know the name of Rishner. Rishner, correct. And this organization that does all this planting and is supported by all of your tax money through the Canadian government was paying their salaries <laughs> for years. They're now in prison. This is uh, the study that we carried out only in 2017, the map of agricultural land seizure by the Palestinian Authority. It is significant. <coughs> we have documentation for every single one of these spots on the map, what the project is, who's paying for it, and how much land we've lost through each one. But we don't have enough time to go through it all. The third tactic is quite mind-boggling and extremely technical. The third tactic is carrying out a land survey and registration in Judea and Samaria. Now this doesn't sound like a big deal, right? In 1967, Israel suspended the survey and registry of land in Judea and Samaria. The Jordanians had undertaken a survey of this kind and didn't finish. The Ottomans actually had undertaken a survey. The British had undertaken a survey. No one finished the job. So not all the land in Judea and Samaria is actually registered. And Israel decided that rather than actually registering the land, figuring out who owns it and registering it legally, they would stop because they were afraid that this would be construed as an act of sovereignty. The British didn't think it was an act of sovereignty. They weren't the sovereign. But Israel was afraid, so we stopped. But, as you know, there is no vacuum. The Palestinian Authority currently employs 630 full-time employees who are carrying out a full survey and registry of land throughout Judea and Samaria, including in Area C, and registering it as Palestinian state land. So you might say, who cares? So they register it. I don't have to listen to them. But if there is no other registry, meaning Israel doesn't have a registry, and there's no other internationally acceptable documents, they've even come to, Palestinians have come to court, to the Israeli courts, and in order to prove land claims, they bring Palestinian, the state of Palestine land registry to, pr to, to promote, to try to uh, obtain rights to land in Area C. It's fraudulent. It's insane. Yeah. So far, the courts in Israel have not accepted these uh, documents as proof, but it's only a matter of time. Because eventually, because there is no such thing as a vacuum, this is going to be accepted internationally, and they have experts from all over the world helping them carry out a full survey and registry to create a land registry of all of Judea and Samaria. And we are fast asleep. Does the uh, Supreme Court of Israel have any influence here? Well, first of all, they should say this is a non-binding document. Right. It's not acceptable. But are they? 
They haven't accepted it yet, but they haven't made any clear statement that it isn't. That's not the does way that have anything to do with the, proactive. Does that have anything to do with the revamping of the Supreme Court that they're trying to do now because no. there's no... No, uh, no. Courts, the courts are not proactive. Courts don't make policy. That's what we try to force the Israeli government to do. Right. Create policy. Carry out a land registry. It's a massive project. Only a government can do it. It is an act up for a large organization. That's why, although Israel's entire... Uh, staff of the civil administration, the people who are involved in land registry issues number, you can count them on two hands, the Palestinian Authority has over 600 full-time employees dealing only with this <coughs> issue. Thank you. So that's all I'm going to show you this evening. Um, I'm going to invite you to find out more all of the things I've shown you here are just on the tip, the tip of the iceberg. There's all this information available on our website, all of our studies, all of these maps, uh, articles, explainers, videos, you name it. And my card is here if anyone has specific questions that we don't get to. I encourage you to send me an email. Uh, anyone who's interested, I would love to add you to our circulation list for newsletters, updates, on court cases, etc., progress in the courts and the government and policy. There was a sign-up sheet circulating here. If you put your name and your email down, I will add you to that. Well, the first thing that we have to do, of course, is thank Naomi for coming yes. and speaking. <laughs> At the same time, we also have to thank Federation and the volunteer people who came out here tonight because they heard that maybe there were going to be protests. We had three previous events that week. there were no protesters at all. There was, just, there was much chatter, but nobody showed up and protested. We really didn't anticipate there would be tonight. So maybe we've done something right, maybe we've done something <laughs> wrong, I'm not quite sure. Um, but what I would say is that we can't allow protesters like this to prevent us from right. shining a light exactly. on what's going on, on exactly. finding out what's going on, discussing what's going on, knowing what's going on. And again, in that vein, I would like to again thank Naomi for coming and speaking to us. Um, um, there has also, unfortunately, been some upsetness within the community, people phoning and saying, why is this happening and how come it's happening at our school? And I hope that they will understand that we should be discussing these things. And Rigavim is certainly an organization that we should be talking about. And this is something Naomi will not say before she leaves, because she won't say this, so I'm going to say it for her. If anybody would like to support Rigavim, Rigavim is a very small organization that, as you can see, is doing a huge job shining a light on the things that other people don't bother shining a light on, the government just ignores what they're doing. They just go on in blissful bureaucracy, mm -hmm. thinking that they can just keep going and nothing's go. I, well, you heard her speak. I don't have to say any more. If you'd like to support Rikavim, please speak to Naomi afterwards. And thank you, Naomi, and questions. So I have done. I would like to know what the hope is there for any change that if Netanyahu didn't do anything in the last 14 years, yeah, you got a minister here, yeah, you're going to take something out of the defense ministry, the administration, he can, he can override everything. We're on the right, we're afraid that he's going to, they're going to topple down around another election. What hope is there? He's, he's going to stop everything as soon as the next EU leader threatens him or Biden threatens him. It's a good question. I, I would be happy to answer it. Before I answer uh, what hope is there uh, in specifics, I will say that there is tremendous hope and there is tremendous optimism in Israel. There always is, but now there's actually a reason for it. Um, I think the election results this past time indicate that the Israeli public has finally woken up to a lot of these issues. Um, we have a lot to deal with in Israel in our, in our day to day lives, but the situation has reached a point where nobody feels they are at leisure to ignore these problems anymore. I think, in general, throughout Israel, for the first time ever, for the first time ever since 1967, 
Israelis from the rest of the country understand that they are unsafe if Yehuda and Shomron are unsafe. And that is a massive shift in consciousness that has taken a long time to be achieved, but I think we're there. Uh, now the question is what we do next, and we have to do it carefully, and we have to, but we have to do it strong, and we have to do it with conviction. And I believe that the incoming government, um, mm -hmm. the fact that I've worked with many of these people for years, uh, I know what they want to accomplish. I know that they are capable of accomplishing it. And we have never had any doubt. That's why Rigovim exists. We have never had any doubt that the state of Israel is capable of doing what needs to be done. And we believe that it will do what needs to be done. We continue to work with all members of Knesset who are willing to hear what we, what we have found and what we think the solutions should be. Not only in Yehuda and Shomron, we're very, very active in the Negev, we're active in the Galil, we're active pretty much everywhere. We have clear, specific, uh, implementable policy <coughs> initiatives that we have presented to pretty much everyone uh, in the government from, uh, let's say, labor till the end. The Arab parties don't, don't speak to us, that's okay. Um, some uh, Bedouin members, some, mem some Bedouin mayors, some uh, members of Knesset behind the scenes from the Arab parties have actually consulted with us. Some of them have come to the realization that some of our policy, that our policy proposals will be the best way forward for their communities as well. No one wants to live in chaos. No one wants to live uh, in, with bloodshed. And we believe that there is a way to solve these issues, respecting the individual rights of all the people living in the land of Israel, but without sacrificing our national rights. There is a huge difference between personal, <clears throat> civil, human rights, religious rights, and national rights. National rights don't really exist unless you create them. And we have no intention of creating them for any other nation in the land of Israel. That is what we believe. One second. Yeah. Yeah, uh, two quick questions. One, in the EU, there are at least a couple friendly countries, um, Czech Republic, I would think. And yeah. And, okay. Yeah, there's a group um, of five now that are actually very okay, pretty, so yeah. they're helpful. Yes. And the second question, if I may, supply chain, like those are massive materials to move in from outside of the country, like somehow, like there is that an opportunity for the government to kind of remotely control or put a choke on that activity? Has that been looked at? We believe that the government of Israel is capable of doing anything it wants to do anything that it puts its mind to. We have done harder things. Yeah. That is why we do what we do. If we didn't think Israel was capable, we wouldn't waste our time and effort trying to get the government to do it. We believe that they can. We believe the government can stop the flow of funds. We believe the, the government can stop the flow of uh, foreign uh, advisors, quote unquote, experts, whatever you want to call them, who are coming into the country to abet uh, illegal activity. We believe Israel has actually um, taken serious steps to halt the uh, presence of anarchists. We had a massive problem a couple of years ago. <coughs> anarchist groups from all over Europe who were coming to support the Palestinians foment violence, stage all sorts of confrontations. And Israel has really got a handle on that in recently. We believe Israel can do all of these things. And we would like to help suggest how to do them. Uh, that's what we do. Thank you. Yes. Um, just to follow up on that question, um, is there any way of choking the EU, like for example, like boycotting, not going to their countries? And also, I missed the part about like, what's Canada, like how are they involved and what can we do to protest against what they're doing? And I guess my third is like, what's your ultimate wish list? Oh, can you repeat the last one? I can try. <laughs> There's a lot of big questions. Um, 
The first question was, like, what, how do we choke you? How do we choke you? Israel is a very, very small country that punches far above its weight. I have been saying for the past six months, I don't know how many times a day I say this same sentence. Somebody's going to hear it. Just because I'm saying it doesn't mean anybody's going to hear it, but maybe you can help me. Israel has to wake up and realize that it is a superpower in many ways. Uh, we're in a situation right now in terms of world history and geopolitics that is unprecedented. More countries need us than we need them. And that is rare uh, in our history. Uh, we haven't been around that long. We haven't been in that great shape. But Israel is a superpower in terms of technology, in terms of in intelligence, in terms of um, medicine, in terms of many, many, many fields. I don't think I need to tell anyone in this room what amazing things Israel has done and continues to do uh, in terms of getting water to parched places in the world, in terms of technology for saving the planet, in terms of medical technology, in terms of everything, and defense and all these other things. And Israel at this point must, must capitalize on its position, use these these tremendous breakthroughs to leverage its political position. Um, no, me, no, me, gas. Gas. The gas. That's what yeah. we should talk about is the gas that they're supplying to the EU. Yeah. They should cut it off unless they cut yeah. it off. Gas is an issue. All sorts of energy, all sorts of technology, water to other countries, all these things. Israel has the ability. Show off to the, just, the, gas, the gas lines that they need. To Israel has to step out of its own shadow. The only one that can, uh, that can keep Israel in the shadows is Israel. And it's time for us to step out of that shadow. So what's preventing Israel from stepping out of its own shadow? Bad, Habit. wife's See, bad habits. See, that's I'd like to know about uh, what you said before about fraud Merkel, not Frau Merkel. Uh, did, when she threatened Israel, uh, was there a document because of that? No document? No. Uh, what about the nuclear uh, vessels? Do we have them yet? Yeah. So why do we just not take the vessels that they can't have back and just... Uh... There are other deals on the table. There's defensive missiles on the table. Ah. There's, all, there's all sorts of things that we don't hear about until afterwards. Yeah. Okay. I'm not prime minister. I don't want to be prime minister. <laughs> One minute, please. Sorry, I'll be here. What's the significance you alluded to about Snow Ridge? with their trying to do something within the civil administration in the Yeah. So what we talked about in a, in a general sense is the fact that Israel has not extended Israeli law to Judea and Samaria. That has opened the door to everything that we saw today. Um, part of the, the existence of we, my husband and I, as residents of Judea and Samaria, are subject to military rule. We are living under military authority, uh, although we are full citizens of the state of Israel, and we pay taxes, and we serve in the army and send our children to the army, and all of these things. You know, we pay our bills, and we get building permits, and we do all of those things, and we're still sur subject to the civil administration, to mil military authority. I'll, I'll be right with you. Um, but the, uh, the time has come to disband this system. It is, not for the, it is not advantageous for anyone. It's not advantageous for Israel as a state. It's not advantageous for Israeli citizens living there. It is certainly not advantageous for the Arabs living under military rule. If the state of Israel makes structural changes towards disbanding the civil administration or removing the civil administration from the defense establishment, from the IDF, and making it an actual civilian uh, body, then we will be going in the direction of extending Israeli law properly to the citizens of the state of Israel first, who live over in Judea and Samaria, and eventually, actually, uh, pursuant to your question, sir, erasing the green line. There should be no more line uh, there should be no difference between Gibbat Zev and Ramot. 
There should be no difference between Ramot and Ashkelon. There should be no difference between any of these places. Uh, and that is the direction that we want to move in. That's the direction we believe is to the benefit of the state of Israel in terms of international law, in terms of the welfare of the people living in the country now and in the future. So those are important steps. They may seem extremely technical and like uh, power plays uh, among the people who are coming into government. They are not. They are substantive. They are crucial changes that have to be made in order to create, uh, in order to extend Israeli law to Judea and Samaria. We're not subject to the pressures of the Israeli government and the Israeli people. We can't be blackmailed like they can, or coerced. We in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. What can we do? What can we, we can sometimes be the dog that wags the tail. Yes. When you can't. Correct. So there are a lot of things that people, uh, that people mm -hmm. living in Canada can do. Uh, I think anyone who values truth and justice should do. First and foremost is to fight the false narratives. When you read a newspaper article that refers to the occupied Palestinian territories or Israeli occupation or Israeli abuses of whatever, don't just read it and say, ugh, and close the newspaper and move on. Send a letter, complain, or send it to me, and I will have 10 people send letters. Don't let the narrative go unchallenged. That's first of all. Second of all, support the organizations that are fighting both the narrative and the actions on the ground. You can do that. You can get your government to do that. You can also demand of your government that they not fall into the humanitarian aid trap. Canadian governments, uh, the Canadian government's activities in, in Judea and Samaria are for supporting indigenous farmers. They create water systems at, which enable indigenous farmers to farm land in Area C. Now, this is a lie. This is how the Palestinian Authority gets millions, billions actually, from foreign governments and creates villages out of thin air and takes over land by laying infrastructure for water because all you need is to lay infrastructure for water and people can live there in these desert areas in IDF firing zones all through the territory in crucial strategic areas along highways on the back fences of Jewish communities. All of these things are being funded by Humanitarian aid. Demand from your government a report of outcomes. Where is the money going exactly? How is this impacting the humanitarian condition of people living in Area C? And they can't answer. I asked this question from uh, when I went to Brussels and I met with Europe, members of the European Parliament. I said, the European government, the European Parliament spends millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions on humanitarian aid to the Palestinian Authority. What are the outcomes? Can you show me a report? Has all this money improved the lives of the people who are living there? How many people are you serving? How many Arabs live in Area C? That they're getting hundreds of millions. Does anyone know? Here's the answer. No one knows. There has never been a census. And so the Palestinian Authority plays this game they encourage people to move in, to stack the deck. Israel has never taken a baseline census and said, okay, there are, as of when the Oslo Accords were signed, there were X number of Palestinians living in Area C. And that's the number that we should be considering in any future political resolution. Not the, the X times to the power of 12 that they have moved in there ever since. But the Palestinian Authority tells the Europeans that there are 300,000 Palestinians in Area C. There are no such thing. 
In one year, in the same year, and I can show anybody who wants to see it, the United Nations had two <coughs> separate reports from two different departments operating in Area C. One report had to prove that it had touched the lives of all the Palestinians living there in order to justify the budget that it had. And they reported, yes, we have touched the lives of the vast majority of Palestinians in Area C. How many people? 60,000. And then the same year, another report that had to request funding in order to run programs for Palestinian in Area C, they said, we need a lot more money because we have to serve 300,000 Palestinians in Area C. Now there's a bit of a difference there. No one ever asked, why does one agency from the same organization have such a divergent number than the other? It's worse than that. The Minister of Defense of the State of Israel began quoting that number, 300,000. He began quoting it, and that is now the accepted number anywhere you look. Look in the newspapers, look in the UN reports, look in the Palestinian Authority reports. How many Palestinians are there in Area C? 300,000. But you know what's miraculous about Area C? The, uh, the Arab population? No one has ever died. <laughs> they don't take anyone off the list. No one has ever emigrated. People who are listed as residents of Area C, villages in Area C, have never set foot in the Middle East. They're second generation Americans, Canadians, or Europeans. But if their parents or grandparents were listed as residents of Area C, they're listed too. Don't take these things sitting down. Demand answers or help us demand answers. Anyone who wants to help us, we're, we're happy to, first of all, put you on our list, help you, help you help us get information to the public, to the press, and to continue to do what we do in terms of our field work and our lobbying and our policy work and our research. And, and if I can add to what Naomi said, Naomi has just given a perspective from Israel to that question. The perspective from Toronto to that question is that everybody who heard her here tonight has to represent this to our community, to all our friends, to our families, to our friends, and to our shuls everywhere we go need to hear this information because, I'm sorry to say this, but unfortunately it seems that we're going to have some pushback from within the community about the fact that this event happened tonight here. Hmm. And we need to be able to stand up and say, no, 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 we're not intimidating. And we've got to share this information. Okay, last okay, question, yeah. okay. and then I'll let you go. Um, just one thing, I know you were saying about the pressures and that. So I mean, as you said, we're now a power force, Israel's a power force. So what I would say is, like, the heck with the pressures. I mean, I don't think they, I mean, I think they can be without the pressures. I think they can, you know, um, how should I forge forward without it? Like, they won't be defeated with these pressures. So, I, I mean, to me, I think enough is enough, and I think they have to go on the offense now. They're too much on the defense. I, I, yes. I hope that that is the case. Start your own land registry. I'll tell you, yes. Well, it takes millions and it takes a government. But what I will tell you is we believe that it's time. We believe that it's doable. And we also believe that whenever Israel shows them, look at recent history, when Israel shows strength, first of all, it empowers Jews all over the world. And it allows Jews to come out of the shadows and to side with Israel. And second of all, when you show conviction, when you show belief in your own tr in the truth when you confront these things head on you're always going to come out ahead because there's no other way to gain the respect of sovereign nations if you don't behave like a sovereign nation you can't expect other people to treat you that way yeah correct yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you.